Okay. So we're going to continue with um, we're looking at two dimensional or three higher you know, motion outside of one dimension, two and three dimensions. We're f specializing right now to projectile motion, which is this um, standard application of constant acceleration. Uh, oh, oh, and I want to point something out. Tomorrow is not a discussion. It's, we, have to, we have one more lecture to finish this chapter, okay? The discussion is going to be Monday on the, this, okay. So let me remind you what we have here. Um, <coughs> we have motion in two dimensions. We have constant negative, constant negative acceleration in the vertical direction due to gravity. There's no acceleration in the x direction. So. In the x direction, we have our simple constant velocity equations here. Very simple. That describes the x motion. The y motion is described by our previously our one-dimensional freefall type equations that we did problems with. We're just superposing. We're a adding these together. The more appropriate word is superposing them. The x motion does not have it does not interfere with the y motion at all. They're two independent motions. They're uncoupled. So what we want to do right now is we talked about uh, this yesterday and did a demo and we'll be coming actually back to this later today. But we want to do an example, problem, example of a problem. And we're focusing here on the simplest non-trivial case. Gosh, I just hit this thing. Okay. We're going to f do the, the simplest non-trivial case here where you, it, the, the projectile is given some initial horizontal velocity. We'll generalize that later, but for right now, this is the simplest case. Um, and let's suppose we have some numbers here. It's the projectile is fired from a height of two meters. This is the ground or the floor. And it's going to travel um, in a path like this. This path uh, turns out to be a parabola, incidentally. I'll, we'll talk, uh, I'll mention that later again. And it strikes the ground or the floor here at some distance, some horizontal distance from the starting point. So it covers length L there. And we're given the height, the initial velocity, and of course the G is 9, this is on Earth, surface of the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. And we want to find the time of flight going to say, take a certain time to do this. Uh, the length here, the horizontal range here, the length covered, and the final speed, the magnitude of this vector just before it hits, and this angle theta here. Okay, so what do we know? Well, this is projectile motion. There's no acceleration in the x direction. Here is the, I want to make a point of this, and I'm going to edit this. Here are the general projectile motion equations. This is absolutely general for any projectile motion. This is a neglecting air resistance, of course, right? This is entirely general, these equations here, and they're written on a previous page. We specialize them to our particular problem here. That's, I think, the best way to solve these problems, problems like this. Here's what we know in general. Let's now specialize it. So in the X motion, we're going to, this is x equals, we're going to call this x equals zero, of course. So x zero, the, the x position at time t is equal to zero is zero. I just killed this. The velocity in the x direction is constant and it's just v zero. So I'm going to replace vx here, which is our v zero. And now I have, applying this to the, to the whole motion here, from here to where, it, just before it hits, or just as it hits, I can see that x is going to be L, and t is going to be the particular value we call the time of flight. So, we take our general equation and specialize it and get this. There's a little bit of a problem here. We've got one equation, and how many unknowns are in there? Two. So we got it. We, clearly, we have to do more. We can't solve this. We can't solve this equation. So we look in the vertical direction. Again, here's the general equation, absolutely general for you know, projectile motion. And what's y zero? Zero. Yeah, you, th you might think that. 
But it, yeah, it's called H. It's called H. Let's not plug the number in, that makes it messy. <coughs> so Y0 is H. I'm going to put H here. What's the initial velocity in the Y direction? Zero. zero. So we zero this out. And then we have one half G, and we're going to apply this, of course, over this interval of time. We can apply it over any time interval we want, but we're going to choose, you know, going from here to here. So this T will then be the time of flight. So I get, I can solve this equation. Um, what I've done here is I've sol simplified, I've solved it for H, okay? You can see that from here we just get this. And now in this problem, and different problems can be different in this regard, we know H, but we don't know the time of flight. So we're going to invert this. We're going to solve this for t. That's easy, right? Just multiply by t, divide by g, take the square root, and we get this. Now, I've got one equation and one unknown. My unknown's on the left. I'm just going to plug the numbers in at this point. So, and everything's at SI units, so the answer should be in SI units. So I get 2 times 2 divided by 9.8, take the square root. I punch this in my calculator, and I get 0.64 seconds. Now that we know the time of flight, now we can go back to our, this equation. Now this has become one equation and one unknown, right? Because we just solved for the time. And we can find this range here. And it's, uh, you just plug it in, and we get, Uh, the range, which is 3.2 meters. So this distance is 3.2 meters. Now what about this final point here? Just before it hits, we want to find this, the impact speed here. Just before it hits, what's that? Well, let's draw a um, triangle construction here. So just before it hits, it has some final velocity and some, some direction here. We don't know. We don't know what state it is. It's going to have an X component which is constant. It's going to be the 5 meters per second. It's going to have a vertical component. We don't know what that is. We have to find it. But that's easy because uh, the, that's an F. God. The final velocity in the X direction. We have, um, oh, so we know this. The f we don't know is the final velocity in the y direction. Well, we have an equation, a one, you know, it's essentially a one-dimensional equation for that. The final velocity is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time for constant acceleration. It's very simple. We saw that in that one-dimensional chapter, chapter on one-dimensional motion. So um, I'm going to plug in here what we have. We have uh, zero initial y velocity, so I have a zero, and then this is just going to be our time of flight. We multiply it by g and we get this, and the negative sign is there because it's negative, right? Shouldn't be there, it's a negative. So how do I find the speed? Well, I use Pythagoras. I just sum the squares of these and take the square root. So I've done that here. Um, well, I have to kill them. Our, our usual procedure here is to not put, so everything is in SI units. We don't need to put them in, in the intermediate, in any intermediate calculations. We just put them in the final answer, right? Make sure your final answers have units, okay? I'll take off on quizzes if you don't have a, you've got to have a unit in the final answer, some units, okay. So we get eight, happens to be close to 8.0 uh, meters per second. What about that angle there? What's that angle? Well, you can see that the tangent of the angle is the final y velocity speed over um, the tangent's going to be this length over that length, or this, this speed over that speed. So we can do that. What's done next here? Now you'll notice here my, you know, my vy is a negative quantity. We're in this, we're using simple trigonometry here. I want the, the mag the you know the magnitude of this. So I've taken the absolute value here. And I punch this in and I get fifty-two degrees. Now you remember, whenever you do an inverse tangent, there's something in the back of your head telling you to beware, right? It may send you to the wrong quadrant. Remember that? 
So here it's entirely reasonable, 50, it's, it looks fine. There's no problem in this case. Yes? Would it be wrong if I said negative 52 degrees given the quadrant that it's in, if I just didn't take the magnitude? Okay, I'd actually make a comment on this here. If you punch in the minus 52, your calculator is going to, if you, excuse me, if you punch in the negative value, the minus 6.3 meters yes. per second, yes. your calculator is going to give you minus 52 degrees for theta. Now that's, you know, that's correct. If, you're, if we're going to measure theta positive from here, then it is correct. You know, it's, just so long as it's clear, you can interpret. This angle right here is 52 degrees, right? But your calculator, you do it that way, it's going to return 50, minus 52. And you just need to understand that, of course, means that it's going down 52 degrees. It's fine. That's fine. That's okay. Because yeah. the fourth quadrant, right? Yeah. It's, it's That's right. Just... Right. Okay. Any other questions about this problem? So we'll do a bunch more of these Monday. You know, standard stuff to do here. Uh, incidentally, from a practical point of view, or more practical, Often, you know, we suppose we don't know this. All right. And um, what what could you do here? Can you yeah. Do the time equation. If you get, if you know what time is going to land. Yeah, you time. can use that. the The idea is that's right. The idea is we can pose this have a have a different perspective on this problem. We can actually experimentally do this to find the muzzle velocity of some spring gun, like this is a spring gun right here. And I've done that before. I've had to do that in demos. I used to do it in this class, but it got a little bit to be too much. But if I want to find the velocity of something here, and you know, this is not going to work real well for bullets, OK? Because it's going <laughs> to be trouble. But for simple, um, you know, like spring guns like this one, by measuring the distance, we can determine, we can treat this from a different perspective. It's not, and if you look at it, you'll see that it's, you know, it, it requires very little modification of what we did here. So you can turn this problem around, you know, turn the tables on this problem or whatever. Instead of determining L, we can measure, we can find V naught. And you can even find um, the height by measuring the time of flight, which can be done if you have a microphone and you send the signal to an oscilloscope or something, or something where you can get the time, you can pick up on the firing as a, as a sound and striking the table. That's actually done in, uh, lab not, in the, not in our laboratory, but in the past it has been done in a projectile motion laboratory in this class. By measuring the time of flight, you can actually find the height. So sometimes it's, it's just useful. You've got to realize there's different ways you can, different perspectives you can have on problems like, like this. Okay, any, um, any questions? Let's see, where are we here? Okay, so here, so that's a standard case. When you fire something horizontally, it goes like that. The next standard case, it's a little bit, little bit more complicated, is that the projectile is fired from some elevation and lands at the same elevation. So that's, it's in this diagram right here. Now we're going to do something different here, and I don't think we've done it before. Uh, this is called the range, we'll call it capital R. We're going to find a formula for the range. You'll see there are no numbers here, right? So we're going to do this alge purely algebraically. And we're going to come up with a formula. And that's very powerful because once you have the formula, then you can apply it to any problem that involves this. You can just use the formula, as long as you use it correctly. We have this general formula that holds for all different values of the parameters here. Okay, so let's do that. What, uh, we're going to phrase our answer in terms of the initial speed and the initial angle. But that's not convenient in the beginning. In the beginning, we want to deal with the initial y component of the velocity and the initial x component. That's what's in our equations, remember? So we're going to carry this v0y and v0x along, but ultimately we're going to substitute this, put it into the nice parameters that we want for use of the formula. Again, we're going to let t be the time of flight. OK. So here we go. We write down our general equations, projectile motion. Here they are. And we 
specialize them. These hold for any time interval here. We're going to choose our time interval, of course, to be, this will be our initial point, this will be our final point. So the initial point is 0 in x and y, incidentally. The final point, this is going to be x equal capital R. Uh, the, over our interval, this little t will be the time of flight, capital T. So we have this. In the y direction, here's our general equation. The initial y is 0. The final y is 0. We have uh, this. We let this be t. We get this. So here are the equations. We have two equations. And how many unknowns do we have? We don't know the range, and we don't know the time of flight. So it's looking good, right? Now you might say, what do you mean it's looking good? It's perfect. There's no problem. Well, not, um, if these were linear equations, so we didn't have this squared here, then I think you're assured of, a, of an answer. But you know, things can happen when they're not simple linear equations. So, but so that's why I say it's looking good and not perfect. So I've got um, these two equations. So what can I do here? Well, I don't know t. Oh, th there's just one unknown in this equation. So this is looking really good now, <laughs> OK? This, there's just one unknown here, and it's t. You'll notice that t is equal to 0 is a solution, as it must be, because we're asking for the time at which the y value is 0. And we're focusing our attention on here, but you know we should remember that that's also a solution. This, we encountered this before last week. So we, we ignore the y equals the t equals zero solution and solve for t and we get this. So here's the time of flight in general. And we've got no we're not going to plug any numbers in. We don't have the numbers. We're doing this just straight algebra. Once I know the time, we've been through a very similar thing just a few minutes ago. Once I know the time of flight, I can just put it into here and get the range. Okay, now I've done something else. I Combine two steps here. I've taken this expression for the time, substituted it into here, and I did something else. What did I do? Just to save space. I substituted for v0x and v0y in terms of what we care about, the speed and the angle. See that? So here I've replaced v0y with this expression, v0x with this expression. Now there's one final step that we normally do here. The cosine of any angle times the sine of any, any angle can be, written more sim can be written in a simpler way. It's, a trig it's, called a, you know, it's one of the many trigonometric identities. You might remember that from high school, or maybe you forced it out of your memory. <laughs> um, so the cosine of any angle times the sine of any angle is always the sine of twice the angle. It's called a double angle formula. Maybe you remember that. OK. So um, makes it a little simpler. So we put it in there. And now we've got a formula for the range, an absolutely general formula for the range. Again, though, you want to remember there are restrictions, of, of, of course, right? For example, no air resistance, right? So you, you, know, you just don't want to take a formula and use it and don't realize what's behind it, OK? So there's no air resistance. And also, it has to, it, the projectile lands at the same elevation that it's fired from. So don't take this formula and try to apply it to, uh, to this situation right? that we looked at before. So you need to remember that. This is always the case, you know? Yes? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's explore this a little bit in general here. Um, now this is not the trajectory. This is a graph of the range versus the initial angle that we're finding. This is sometimes called the angle of elevation. I think it's the, we use the angle of elevation. Yeah, we use the angle of elevation, right? Our theta naught, this is our initial velocity. Here's the ground. That, this is the angle, right? It's called angle. You guys probably know the angle of elevation. OK. This is a, a sketch of the range versus the angle of elevation for a fixed initial speed. And what you see here is, a, is something that uh, everybody knows. 
okay, that the angle that maximizes the range is what? 45 degrees, right? So if I want to fire something off and it goes from one elevation to the same elevation, I fire it off here, if I want to maximize the range, if it's down here, it's just going to go, you know, something like this. If it's up here, the initial velocity is going to go like this. The maximum occurs at 45 degrees. Well-known fact. You guys know, does this ring a bell? Uh, yeah. Something that most people remember, or if they don't, they buy into it. They go, of course. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But let me, I don't want to get into it anymore right now. There's another thing you notice from this graph. Suppose we don't fire it at 45 degrees. Suppose we fire it down like this and it goes like that, hits over here. There's going to be another angle for which it lands at the same position, right? So, and those angles are simply related. So, this is, now this is what we would actually see. If I fire it at some shallow angle and it goes here, right? There's another angle here. At this state or not, there's another state or not that gives me the same range, and it's just the complementary angle. What, what are, you know, it's 90 degrees minus. These two angles sum to, mind, sum to 90 degrees. I think they're called complementary angles. That's just a word, though. So if this were, oh, we'll see an example for a moment. But you're going to get the same range. So it's not unique, you know, you can get the same range for two different angles, which is very plausible here. Very plausible that, that you're going to have those two possible angles. Um, okay, any questions? So that's a general, we just did like a general theory. Let's apply it to a specific, with a, look at a numerical example here. So, Again, we have a, we're firing off projectile at some elevation, it lands the same elevation. We're given the initial speed and the angle elevation here. We want to find the height and the range. Now, this is an important point. We have a formula for the range. It's a standard formula. It's in all introductory physics textbooks. You don't need to derive it. So on a quiz, if I ask you, you know, What's the range here? Please do not rederive this. Sometimes a student, every once in a while, somebody does this. So we just we have a formula for this. If we didn't, then you have to you know you have to go through it. So you want to recognize that you know make life easy here. Let's use the formula, and here's the formula. All right, and we're going to find these two quantities here. Let's find, we have a formula for R, so let's go ahead and do that. We know everything here. We just have to punch it in. It's easy, right, once we got the formula. And it's 5.7 meters. Um, how do we get the height? Well, the height, you know, we've, the information we have here, there's no, we have no time information. Right? And we're after the height, which that's not, no, we're not after the time. So you might be naturally led, and this is just, there are different ways of doing these problems, but the easiest thing here, I think, is just to go to the no time equation to get the height. So here's the, again, here's the general no time equation for constant acceleration, constant negative acceleration in the y direction. That's the general equation. We now apply it. And what interval of the motion are we going to look at here? Are we going to go from here to here like we usually do? No, we're going to go, and it's completely at our disposal, right? We're the masters here, right? <laughs> Whatever. So we're going to take this to be the initial point and this to be the final point. So I apply it to this general equation. What's the final y velocity? Zero. Zero. It's purely x there. It's turning around. It's a turning point with respect to y. So that's zero, uh, minus 2g. This is the uh, y0 zero, zero, and y is what we call this, we're calling capital H here. So I get this equation, I can now solve this for h, and I get this. Now, I want to point, I didn't mention in the notes here, but I want to point something out. This is a, don't worry about this, okay? This is a formula right here. So some authors, when they do the range formula, 
they also, going along with that, they give you this, um, what happened here? Something happened. Sorry. <laughs> you know, we, we put a box around this. You know, it's a um, pretty general formula, for, but for not for all projectile motion. It's got to take off and land at the same height. They also add on here the H. They put a box around the H to get the height. That's, there's nothing wrong with that, OK? Uh, but usually, it's the range that's important. So that's why I just did the range. But we've generated a formula. This is an entirely general formula for our case of what the height is. We can plug the numbers in and we get 0.82 meters. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Would you say that R and H are formulas? That means anytime you're given that information up there, you can plug those in, right? You can plug any values in, yeah. Algebraic noodling. Algebraic what? Noodling. I, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Noodling? Uh, Algebraic oh. gymnastics. Oh, I see, yeah. But you can still rearrange that equation and solve for theta or for... Yeah, theta. yeah. See, in physics, we, we, and we, I'm, trying, I'm trying to teach you this. It's just not finding the right form. I know, you know, people are naturally, everyone's busy, and they, you know, people are tired and they're lazy, and they just give me the formula, right? And sometimes research is like that. You know, you're, you're after something that nobody, you, nobody's done before, and you want to get to that point, and you don't want to worry about how, how a formula is derived, right? Just give me the formula and, I'll, and, 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 and use it. But, you, but you've got to be careful. Every formula has some restrictions, right? For example, you know, this formula here pertains to this particular case, this case right here, okay? And you, you know, if you just look at this H here, you might think it applies to something else. I don't know, you can easily you know, be wrong. So in, in physics, we usually have an appreciation for what's, we want to know what's behind these formulas. We usually try to have an appreciation. But I admit, when I'm doing research, sometimes, you know, I'm just going to Wikipedia, I'm getting the answer, and I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, Wikipedia is not always right, which it isn't, okay? And I found cases in acoustics where it's wrong, and I didn't correct it because I don't have the time, right? So, and I'm sure there's a lot of other people doing the same thing, professors doing the same thing, okay? So, I, what was your in initial question? I got completely carried away. <laughs> Was that? You answered it. Okay, good. Somehow I, okay. Yeah, algebraic noodling. Okay. Okay, well, here's the most general projectile motion problem. You fire the projectile off from some height. It lands at a different elevation, right? Of course. All right? And, um, and of course, this theta zero can be anything. Can theta zero be negative? Sure, and I'm sure there's artillery cases where that's happened. You're on some kind of bluff, you know, some kind of hill, and you, I don't know if it's ever happened, actually. Has it? Wow, okay. I know the, the other case has. Can H be negative? Now, I'm trying to teach you how to think like physicists, see? Everyone out there, they see H, and you know, it's a, it's a height. It's got to be positive. I, you know, I don't have to think of it. Wait, 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 what's going on here? We had a, we're having a discussion, a random. So let's, I'm sorry, so let's go back. Can H be negative? Can H yes. be down here? Yes, yes, it can. So that would be our firing artillery, somebody up, somebody up on a hill or something. You know, you're firing something um, here. Let's go the opposite way, if, if you allow me to do that. You're firing something here and you want to hit something up here, right? So that's in this diagram, it's just a negative H. So this is, encompasses the general problem. So it, does any, anyone, any comments on that? Yes? So basically, just you guys should take this equation and work it completely from the other side, basically firing from negative h on top of the hill, just to rework it. Yeah, now we're not, that turns out to be, a, a, I guess it'll be a little bit difficult. And so it's probably a homework problem in, in the back of the book, and I don't think we're going to do it. But you, got, you, you have exactly the right idea. 
And that's how physicists think, okay? And you could be doing research, and you know, this may not be in the literature. It is in the literature, of course, obviously. But, you know, 300 years ago it wasn't, right? So what, how would you handle this? Well, you'd go back to the general equations and start to look at the initial point, the final point, and you'd crank through and solve. And in this case, you actually have to use the quadratic formula, it turns out. You know, we got t squareds floating around. It ends up being, you have to solve the quadratic formula. Now, so instead of doing, spending our time going through this algebra, which, which I've been through, incidentally, uh, but I don't want to drag you through it. Let's look at this from a more uh, qualitative or a demonstration point of view. So here's this, I've arranged the situation here. Here's the, this is the spring gun, as I mentioned. And here's the projectile, it's a plastic ball. And I can, um, oops, I can cock this thing. And for this demonstration, there's three different initial speeds, okay? See it cock right there? That's the first one. That's the second one. That's the third one. And we just, for this demonstration, it's appropriate just to do the first one. Okay? So I'm firing it here. It's going to hit the floor. So our H is this distance from here down to the floor. Ignore this photo gate. That's for the next demonstration. And I've set the angle here. Oh, sorry. What's the angle that maximizes the range? 45. Okay. So I've set it at 45. Right? Yep. You, have to, you just have to trust me. It's, for, it's, it's 45. And it should look like 45 to you. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to fire it on three. I've done this a number of times yesterday and this morning. I put a meter stick anchored by some kilogram, uh, two kilogram weights there so that you'll see where it hits. Now if you can't, you can, you're welcome to get up and walk over there. It's fine, okay? So it should hit the meter stick, okay? One, two, three. Wow, it was right on that time. It's fluc there are fluctuations. Okay, it hit right on the top, okay? And the meter stick didn't move because I weighted it down, okay? Now, I'm going to change the angle of elevation here to th uh, 35. I'm going to make it less. You can see that I'm making it significantly less. And it happens to be 35. Not really important as long as it's significant. Okay, now we're going to do it again. First indent, they call it. One, two, Anybody see that? Shorter. Shorter? Yeah, it was longer. Yeah, it was longer. Yeah, this problem, you can't see it. Sorry. So somebody saw it, right? It's, yes. Yes, it's longer. Right? Yes. Right. Anybody have any questions? I thought it was supposed to be 45 degrees. So I thought it was But it was only if you go across yeah. the, yep. to the same initial height. And this is not that case. This is not this case. This is not that case. Now, it still could have been that 45 maximizes the range, but it just doesn't happen here. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> it actually does. Now, this is not a rigorous, we're just being plausible here, okay? <clears throat> when I want to maximize the range, I want to do two things. I want this component of the velocity to be as big as possible, because I want to cover as much range as I can. But I can't just set it like that because then there's, it's not in the air any time, right? I want, this, and bo I want both of these to be as big as possible, okay? But I'm limited. I have a constant speed. So it's reasonable <coughs> that 45, for this case, taking off here, landing here, it, it's reasonable that 45 degrees will do it. But what happens when I'm up here? If I want to maximize the range, it's already going to be in the air a long time because it's, it's got this height, right? So it's, it's plausible that you want to take away from this component and add it to this component so you can cover more ground. And that's exactly what's happening. How would you determine the angle that maximizes the range, analytically? We have to know the height. Huh? It's going to change depending on the height relative to the target. Yes, it's the, the angle that maximizes the range is a function of h. 
at h is equal to zero, it's 45. When h is positive, it's less than 45. How would you determine a formula for that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to find a formula for the range that we were just talking about. You need to find a formula. So suppose you have a formula for the range, in this case, <clears throat> which we don't have here, okay, but it exists. What are you going to do with that formula? You've got r is equal to, it's going to involve all these quantities here, except r. You know, that'll be on the left-hand side. There'll be an expression on the right-hand side. What do you do to find the, the angle that maximizes r? Well, you take the derivative of that expression with respect to theta naught and set it equal to zero. That's, remember differential calculus? Yeah. And you can do that, and you can end up with a formula. And I've seen it, I've done it. I don't think we're gonna do it if we, we're not gonna do it here, I can guarantee you that. We might do it in a problem session, but I don't, I don't think so. It gets a little messy, again, you gotta deal with quadratic formula. So it's not a big deal, but it exists, okay? And that's how you would do it. You'd use calculus. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Um, any any questions? Okay, we got plenty of time. That's good. So, um, I can't believe that none of you had heard of the monkey hunter problem or seen the demonstration. <clears throat> God, I wonder what kind of universities you went to. <coughs> Like the academy? Yeah. <laughs> Is Mur Murray Corman still there? <laughs> oh, sorry? <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. So, this is a traditional experiment that goes way back. Okay, I don't know how far, I've never looked into it. I sometimes explore this because I publish demonstrations. I don't know if I told you guys this. I um, do research, one of my research areas is um, educational physics and part of that is I do demonstrations and when I come up with new demonstrations I sometimes publish them if I want to go to all the trouble to publish it if I think it's worth it which it's usually not but anyway um, so I do look into the history of some demos but I've never looked into the history of the monkey hunter but I can tell you this for a long time, every physics department had to make their own apparatus. And then finally, this company called PASCO, finally, like a couple of decades ago, can't remember, they came, you can, they, they sell it to you. You can buy it now. And it's, I put it on the box here. This is really old, but <laughs> uh, this apparatus costs over $700. Oh, I run the demo room, so I do stuff like, have to do stuff like this. Okay? I want people to keep it in a box, which they don't. I want them to be careful with it because it's expensive, but they're not. Okay? <laughs> so, professors are bad people. So, um, oh, look at this. Look at the email address here. So, that was a long time ago. We got rid of the, we went EDU a long time ago. And it helps. It helps. If you're a professor, it helps. So. We, uh, the professors here insisted upon it. Pardon me? Does it give you validity as a professor when it doesn't say it maybe that long? To the academic community, yeah. And that shouldn't be, but that's just the way, you know, people are like that. They have biases, you know. Yeah. So that's why it was done. It was done in um, early 2000s, or I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. Okay, so here it is. Here's the PASCO apparatus. Now, I need to plug it in. And let's, uh, let, oh, sorry. There's an electromagnet there and I don't want to put a lot of current through it because it'll heat up. And then the strength of the electromagnet will go down. This is just marginally work. So let's first of all talk about what, what is the monkey hunter problem? Well, first of all, um, it's been around a long time. But starting a few decades ago, or maybe even more, people decided that you shouldn't kill the monkey, that's not good. So it's, now it's like the monkey conservation worker or monkey biologist <laughs> problem, <laughs> and, uh, where, the, where the, the projectile is a tranquilizing dart. Okay? So it could be that the monkey has a broken leg and they're going to fix it. And there's actually a program now. Have you guys seen this? It's pretty new. It's on PBS 
where it's about these uh, biologists and vets and stuff, and they go out and they 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 make house calls on wild animals to fix them. To you guys seen this? I'm not kidding. <laughs> so. So you know, some hippopotamus has uh, has some kind of medical problem, and they think they can fix it with surgery. So they tranquilize it and they fix it, and then that's it. And so there's this people out there doing this. Kind of interesting, right? Okay. So here's the idea. It's convenient to stick with the gun. Okay, and I'm sure you guys won't mind this. I doubt if you'll mind it, but um, it's just convenient here. So I'm going to stick with the old description. So this monkey is hanging from a limb here, and this hunter wants to shoot the monkey. And the rule here is that they're both looking at each other thinking, you know, what, what, what am I going to do here? How are we going to handle this situation? The monkey thinks, um, look, when I see the smoke, let's assume there's some smoke coming out of, I guess not all rifles are like this, but let's suppose there's some, there's a flash. You can see something here, a flash or some smoke. The monkey says, as soon as I see that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop, I'm going to release and fall down. Okay? And the hunter knows that. The hunter is, a, is an expert on monkeys or something. He doesn't know monkeys think like that. So the question is, where should the hunter aim to hit the monkey? Where he's going to land, not where he's going to, not where he's at right at that moment. So look, so again, this is the initial situation. The hunter has to aim, has to find a certain direction to aim. The hunter pulls the trigger. The monkey's going to release, release as right when that triggers, right when the bullet's fired. So the question is, where should the hunter aim to hit the monkey? That's well posed. Jeff, that, I don't know. If, uh, yeah. That's well posed. Okay, that's the first thing you got to realize. So it's not obvious, right? So what do you guys think? Should the hunter aim a little bit below? That seems reasonable. Yeah. It doesn't seem reasonable to aim above, I don't think. Does it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, good question. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's independent, as we'll see. This is not an easy problem. So because it's not an easy problem, we're going to approach it like a lot of physicists approach. They punt. No, I don't know. But what they do is you look, you find a simpler case. Start off with what you know. So let's say the rifle is at the same elevation as the, as the hunter. So the hunter's in some kind of tower here, okay, if, if you insist, okay, there's some kind of, or whatever, or in, also in a tree. Where should the hunter aim to hit the monkey in that particular case? Now, I know what's going on in your heads, even though you may not know. You've <laughs> kind of seen this before, okay? Take this and put it on this, put it over here. That's, that doesn't change anything, right? So, what's the answer? Where does the hunter aim in this particular case? Here's the hunter, there's the rifle. Remember this situation? Both of these balls are released at the same, objects are released at the same time, and they're at the same height. We know they're gonna cover the same vertical distance. So if I imagine this moved over here, let's say here, if I take these and move them over here, and I'm aiming right at that body, what's going to happen? It's going to hit. So we know the answer to the monkey hunter problem for when, the, when they're at the same, the rifle's at the same elevation as the monkey. We know the answer is you've got to aim right at the monkey. So what will happen is you fire the gun, same time the monkey releases, and we have a situation like this. Okay. Now, for, in a real case of a bullet, the monkey's going to drop very little, right? So, but but that, you get the idea. It's going to look something like this. And they're going to hit. Okay, that's one special case. There's another special case that you probably wouldn't think of. What if there were no gravitation? What if there were no gravity? When the monkey releases, so most people don't think of this, but physicists do. That's what, how physicists think, right? So what's going to happen when the monkey releases? Not going to go anywhere. So where do you aim? Yeah. So we've got two special cases where you aim right at the monkey. So now, there's another thing that physicists do. And I, I don't think of physicists like this, but physicists can be very bold. 
and most people, you guys wouldn't say it's being bold at all, but, but it is in a way bold. Let's, let's go with that. Let's, let's assume and see if, it, if we can get this to work. Let's assume that you should aim right at the monkey in the general case here. That's a bold move. Do you feel it? It's bold. Because <laughs> you know, some of you are thinking, you can't do it. How do you know that? You can't do that. Yeah, we can do that. We can just take a guess and see, where, see if we can learn. Because we're trying to solve this complicated problem. So this is how research works. Okay, so now there are different ways to explain this. But here's the one one, well, here's one way, okay? We're gonna go back here now to, way back to the beginning, back to basics. Yeah. We have constant acceleration. <clears throat> and I want you to look at the vector equations here. So these equations, they're, they're perfect, they're the same information as these. It's just they're more compact, it's in vector. We combine these two to get that, we combine these two to get that. Okay, so we're going to use um, we're going to use this one. Well, actually, this one too. Well, you know, this this is a special case of this one. There's no acceleration. So here's the idea. This is not easy to see. It's, it's not really not easy. Um, not easy to see this. Let's call this our origin, where the, where the bullets, we're going to call that our origin. We can do that. We can call the origin anywhere we want to. Um, and we're going to let the time of flight be the time it takes for the bullet to go to here, to the same x location as the monkey. Here's the monkey. So that's going to be the time of flight. So the bullet's going to do something like this. We want to see if the monkey, here's the, the monkey obeys this. The, the, the displacement of the monkey. This is the displacement of the monkey. Okay? And this is where the, um, this is the position of the bullet. We want to see if they coincide at the same point. That's the, whole, that's the whole object here. So, if you look at this, forget this, this tells me where the bullet is at this fi at, at the time, final time when it reaches this x location, the x location right here. But you can see this is also for the, mo if I want to describe where the monkey is, the vector from the origin to the monkey is precisely this. This is the displacement of the monkey. If I want to get the vector where the, where the monkey is, I have to add this to it. <coughs> the vector position of the monkey is this plus that. <coughs> They're identical. So that means you should aim right at the monkey, which is not obvious. And I agree the solution is not obvious too, but this is the simplest thing I, way I've found to do it. But let's test it. So the monkey is here, over here. Okay, you can see this has been through a lot. I had to do some repairing yesterday. And there's an electromagnet up there. And, and it should be on. Okay, and it just marginally works, so I have to be real careful how I do it here. Uh, see, it's a, oh. Whoa. I don't feel good about this. Of course, you know, when I was testing it many times, it... Okay. Now, so that's, that's okay. It's angled a little bit, but can you guys see it? Gene, you're picking it up, right? Okay. There's a laser here. Right here. that goes right along the direction of the spring gun. So our theory says that we should aim... I'm loose. I'm going to tighten it now. And... So that's, that's good. That's close enough. Okay, so we're aimed right at the monkey. <clears throat> There's a photo cell here, a photo gate. I hit it again. Cheap equipment, you know. <laughs> um, 
when it's armed, when I arm it in this little control box here, when the projectile passes, there's a beam of infrared light here. When it cuts that beam, it's going to cut the, the current to the electromagnet is going to be cut, and the, the target will fall. So the target's going to fall right at this point right here. So we, we've got, met the conditions of the monkey hunter problem. Okay, so I'm going to cock this, and now we're going to go all three. Okay, and now it's armed. Okay, you can't see the laser because the ball's in the way. Okay, now you, this happens quickly, so you got to watch, watch. I'm going to do it on three, okay? One, two, three. Yeah. So that's the famous monkey hunter <laughs> demonstration. <laughs> and if you feel a little confused about the theory, I don't blame you. A lot of people go through this. But if you have any, you know, you can look at it. If you have any questions, you can always drop by and talk to me. Okay, so we'll finish this chapter tomorrow. I mean, that's pretty